My name is Colin Smith. I am pianist and teacher at Wonderland Performing Arts. And today we'll be looking at several different piano practicing habits, improvisation, ear training, and some keyboard history. So join me as we explore the world of the keyboard. pieces composed by the illustrious Anna Smith in 2007, arranged with permission from the composer. <laughs> now then, let's begin with some practicing habits. I want you to think, just for a moment, of your brain being a sort of filing cabinet, and as you learn a new scale or pattern, or perhaps reading new notes on the page, you want to feed the correct information into the filing cabinet. So the brain acts as your little secretary, taking the information and filing it away. Well, as far as we go, we must go slowly and with as much accuracy as possible. Let's take, for instance, we make a mistake. <laughs> That's fine. This is the place for mistakes. But we have to go back into the filing cabinet and pull it out and file the correct information away. So. Be as accurate as possible the first time around. Also, remember to be patient with yourself. One doesn't get to Carnegie Hall by just running through it all the time. You have to stop and take stock of rhythm and harmony and even a little bit of improvisation. But remember that your brain's absorbing the information and as you go it needs time. Time to file the information. So, after you've been practicing for, let's say, a good half hour or perhaps an hour, depending on your age and your experience, remember to take a break. Right now I'm taking one. <laughs> after you've been practicing for a while, it's important to stop and do something completely different. Use your brain in a different way. Read a book, just a chapter or so. Take a walk around the house, or perhaps no. Wash a few dishes. <laughs> Something that uses the brain differently allows you to relax, allows you to stop processing in, a, in an intelligent manner and, and to, well, relax, <laughs> for lack of a better term. It's important at all times to maintain one's posture. Now, does sitting upright 24 hours a day get you into Carnegie Hall? No. In fact, it's not so good on your back. It's important to take breaks, but it is also important for my next point, which is, oh yes, you're back. <laughs> Occasionally, 
It's fun to indulge in oneself. One's back is integral to playing the piano correctly, and we have to take care of ourselves. Take a massage, go to the spa, do something that really helps you get in tune with your, your back and your shoulders and the way that you use your body. Posture is very important. For instance, as one sits on the piano bench, one should sit on the edge of the bench. Is that the most comfortable? No. But it allows you to have control over the instrument and let gravity help you with the weight. Now, once you have practiced for a good hour and a half or so, take a break. Maybe have a lie down. Remember that your back deserves just as much care as your brain. Once you follow these three practice habits, motivation comes. It's important to realize that practicing, while important and sometimes monotonous, is not a chore, but a ladder with lots of little rabbit trails along the way. So, remember, your brain needs a break. That's the second word, break. Take a break. And remember your back. Take care of yourself. Now let's move on to a little bit of ear training. Learning by ear, while a very slow and oftentimes rudimentary skill, is integral to the musical process. Some people can sit down and listen to the radio and figure it out. Other times, well, myself included, I have to pause it and rewind and listen again. I really want to maintain accuracy, but then again, I'm really picky. Ear training is essential, because if you can hear the correct way, you know when you've made a mistake and you know how to fix yourself. Sometimes, we must balance this. No, <laughs> not sometimes, all the time, we must balance this with what, what is on the page. <clears throat> Let's begin with some rudimentary ear training examples. Major keys, which are happy, lighter keys, sound like so. Minor keys, a little darker, perhaps sad, sound like this. Now remember that these are qualities, major and minor. They are not volumes. So major can be soft or it can be loud, each one entailing a different emotion. Minor, the same can be said. Minor could be soft, or it could be loud. As you play, remember not to let the ear trick you. Now let's see if you can tell. Major or minor. Mm. Listen again. Now, you said major, you're correct. Let's move on. Listen again. Now then, if you said minor, you are correct. Now let's mix it up a bit. I'll play three in a different order, and you tell me the order. Or at least I hope you will. I can't hear you. Listen one more time. Now then, if you said major, minor, major, you're correct. It's fun to listen to music. Listening is very important. And sometimes in the car, if you happen to be listening to the radio, you might want to guess, hmm, is this in a major key or a minor key? Hmm. I'll have to go back and look at Mr. Collins' video which I would say, good for you. Next on our list is listening to rhythm. Rhythm can be counted in many different ways, but today we'll focus on two examples, in three or in four. You've all heard of three, four, because it's sort of like a waltz. A waltz is a very popular dance. If you don't know that, shame on you. Strong B 
beat has the bass note, and two and three are a little bit lighter. So we have one, two, three, one, two, three. Now we also have four beats, which is much more common. We also call it common time. Strong beat on one, and beats two, three, and four are a little lighter. This can, of course, be divided into two, or it can be multiplied into eight and to twelve. There are many combinations. So we have three, four, and we have four, four. Listen and see if you can tell what rhythm this one is. I certainly hope you do. This is in 3-4. It's a delightfully melancholy tune, almost pensive. I just came up with it. You're welcome. Now then, let's go on to another rhythm. See if you can tell which one this is. similar to our previous melodies, this one is in 4-4. Four, four. We again have a strong beat on 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Now then, some of you might say, well, that seems that music is, is very similar to math. And you might be right. But all that quadratic algebraic ness is uh, not quite so difficult. Addition, subtraction, even multiplication are used in music, and they are very useful of all time. Let's move on to something I like to call question and answer, or perhaps in a simpler way, finished and unfinished. Melodies have rhythm, as does our daily conversations with our friends or family. Conversation has rhythm. When are you going to do the laundry? See, the rhythm matches the words. Now, at the piano, we have questions and answers. One sounds unfinished, and the latter sounds finished. Now, here's another example of unfinished. the answer. Ah, even though the melody did go up, it still has a definitive answer. This is because of two things called tension and release. Here we have tension. But you can't very well end a piece like that. I don't care who you are. This must lead to the end. Now classical composers like Mozart and Handel like to beat us over the head with this. It's like, the end is here! Here's the end! Have it! And to which I say, no thank you, calm down, Mozart. Now then, let's have a little bit of intermission, and you can listen to me play something very nice.
the tune which is called Maccabeus from George Frederick Handel in 1747. Delightful. Whoops, I'm back. Now then, let's talk a little bit about improvisation. This dates back to many long years ago. It is important to note that once a musician learns the music, the job of which to portray the composer's work as an art form, then the second time around he repeats the tune and decorates it, much as one decorates a Christmas tree. So listen to this melody. again to me decorate the score. See, I've added some notes. I've sort of forced them in there and stuck all kinds of glittery, shiny objects on the branches of the music, and I have decorated it with what are called ornaments. This is one example of improvisation. In the classical period, while the orchestra gets bigger, as the instruments get better, so do the soloists in the orchestra. So, you have a number of 40 to 50 people playing in the orchestra, and the soloist, of course, is out front. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and at a point in the score, you have all of this music, and then we're all holding this one note, and we're waiting on the soloist to play what is called a cadenza. What is a cadenza, you might ask? Well, I'll tell you, a cadenza is, well, a solo of some sort. Sometimes written in, sometimes completely made up by the soloist himself, but the cadenza is the last big part for the soloist to <laughs> show what he's got before the orchestra goes. So, I will demonstrate the melody of the orchestra. member the piece is over. Moving on. Let's talk a little bit about the instruments of the period. In Renaissance and the Baroque period, we have an instrument very popular called the harpsichord. Harp, of course, is a very small instrument where you pluck. They've gotten bigger since then. Likewise, the harpsichord plucks the strings. I seem to have left my harpsichord behind. Anyway, so you have a string and the little key is depressed and the hammer comes up to pluck the string and goes back into position. So there's sort of a mechanical click as you push it up and it ting plucks the string. Now, the piano is different because it taps the string. So here's the string, you press the key and the hammer comes up to tap the string and it sort of bing bounces away. So there's the string has a nice long sound until you lift your finger. So here we are, we have the hammer and it taps the string until you lift. Isn't that marvelous? And the difference between the two is that the harpsichord has one volume, one mechanical motion to ping, tap the string, no matter how hard you depress the keys. The piano, of course, is a much more versatile instrument in that it can do both loud or soft. Well, let's do something happy. Ah, that's better. Now then, moving on. Our composer spotlight, one of my favorites, Monsieur Claude Debussy. Now, if you haven't heard of him, shame on you. 
Claude de Debussy has to be one of the most important French composers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He was a revolutionary who, whether he liked it or not, created a genre we like to call Impressionism, directly after Romantic period, the Romantic period. Impressionism, meaning to give an impression of something, it means that there are, there are no clear defined lines or thoughts. It, it's just a conglomeration of, of feelings and colors and patterns that you draw from it your own picture. The shimmering tonalities in his music with their vague blurred outlines are a counterpart to the goals of painters, novelists, and poets of his time. They evoke the mysterious dreamlike world of of shapes and fantasy and magic. He said, Debussy that is, music has this over painting. It can bring together all manner of variations of color and light, a point not often observed, though it is quite obvious. Despite the fact that he founded a school of music called Impressionism, he didn't like the term. He wrote, I'm trying to do something different. In a way, reality is what the idiots call impressionism. It's a term used as badly as possible. The facts about his life and professional training cannot by themselves explain how and why this new music developed. There were many influences, both musical and non-musical, that shaped his art. Some of them are so profound that their effects are clearly noticeable in other arts and sciences. sciences. Similarly, paintings. Paintings as, for example, the painting of um, the island of La Grande Jatte, a painting by George Seurat on which the musical Sunday in the Park with George is based. It is a beautiful work of art made up of teeny tiny little dots. If one comes too close, it's a, it's a, a mixture of all different colors, red and blue and yellow and green. But if you back up, if you take account of the piece as a whole, you see the portrait, the painting, come to life. A painting of serenity, a normal Sunday in a park. Impressionism is probably one of the greatest art forms, although some would beg to differ and say that it's just blurry lines. So I want you to go and listen to him. Listen to Debussy and see what you think of some of his stuff. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you soon.